the, the State Board reserves the first 15 minutes of each board meeting for public comments. For anyone who is not already on the agenda, we have two people sign up with three bits of commentary. Um, one of them will be a, a letter read into the record. And so I'm quite pleased to invite Lloyd Welch and Rob Hernandez to join us. Good morning to you both again. Good to see you both. If you would introduce yourselves for the record. And Ms. Welch, do you want to start with Ms. Frowney's mm -hmm. letter? And the letter is from Jerry Frowney. Um, Ms. Welch, will you Sure. Yeah, my name is Helen Welch. Mm -hmm. I'm a director of the county, and I have a letter here that I'll ask around. And it's from Jerry Crony, MSW, which went to Lakewood, from the CHS State Coordinator. Regarding the issue of adult protective services and the problematic practice of lacking transparency with the public, I'm suggesting that the lack of due process <coughs> also absence of notifications all involve persons <coughs> of the initiation of the investigation. I would suggest a solution to this problem. CDHS needs to research all involved parties and prepare a standardized document for use on the ground in local counties. This APS document would alert persons of the start of an investigation and of their rights prior to the start of an investigative process. This notification would alleviate the complaints that would otherwise result. In addition, I request public comment through the telephone to stay coordinated as well as other public CDHS board commissions, such as the APS Task Force and the Adult Aging Subtax Meetings, as a disability accommodation to fully hear from stakeholders like me. Families who are homebound with caregiving responsibilities are not able to attend in person. I personally have physical challenges that prevent my attendance at some meetings. I believe as a state of Colorado me with all the symptoms I to provide this accommodation consistently. Or Thank not. You for your consideration and commitment to inclusion and public engagement. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have lunch in tomorrow if that's okay. These are my person. comments. All right. Um, thanks so much for the good discussion in Fort Collins. I really learned a lot, and I think that it ended up being a longer discussion than maybe we intended on, but I think it was the depth was necessary. Um, as you know, I live with disability every day. My 10 year old son has Down syndrome, he's non verbal, and has a lot of behavioral and psychological. My community appreciates the care and the great concern and the consideration that this body is given to the APS on the rules that are in promulgation right now. I do have a couple of concerns more about process, and the first category would be transparency. Um, transparency around the work session this morning. The 8.30 work session was not posted on the state public calendar, although it was on the agenda for the state board meeting, which was under 10, 10 a.m. So I really request that the work session be posted on the public calendar online. Also, the docs, PowerPoints, and information used during today's meeting were not posted anywhere for the public to access. Also, I would like to request an audio recording be accessible of the state board work sessions as a disability accommodation for those unable to tune in at the time of the presentation. And I know personally that the Arapaho County Commissioners do this with all of their work sessions for public transparency and engagement. And lastly, um, under transparency, the go-to meeting works for some people, but I had one woman from a rural area text me this morning asking for a call-in phone number because her internet is not reliable enough to use as a way to engage in this meeting. So she would like me to request that there also be a regular call and phone number as well as a go-to meeting, similar to what um, you all did during our uh, last stakeholder meeting. So there's two options for people to be engaged. And I also want to thank you for um, and Mindy Kemp and her team, Ed Rogers, for setting up a series of three stakeholder meetings coming up. I think those are really critical to the process of getting people involved in the community. I posted it on um, many different listservs um, and shared it with people and they're sharing it with other people. So I predicted good involvement at those. Um, those are three evenings in March. And I would really like to see some of you could participate either in person or uh, remotely, either through the phone or the virtual meeting. Um, the first one um, is next Thursday. And I was glad to see, on a positive note, that these stakeholder meetings were also posted on the public website. So anyone logging into the DHS website can uh, know that there is a public stakeholder 
components. That's excellent. Uh, one concern that was raised at the last stakeholder meeting held here in this building was the fact that you have to get a driver's license to enter the building. Uh, this is a barrier of participation. In Colorado, you can vote without a driver's license. Having an ID requirement for a lot of people is a barrier. Um, I personally worked in special education, and a lot of my students rode the 15 Colfax famous bus, and their pockets were picked on a regular basis. So half the time they had an ID, half the time they didn't. People that um, are out in the public, uh, especially if you come from a more challenging socioeconomic background, having an ID is not an easy thing to do. And then you lose your birth certificate, you have to have all these proofs to go and get your replacement ID, which they charge you for. So I'd like to ask why um, that requirement is here in this building. It is a barrier, and there's also a concern about why CDHS needs this information. Um, even to go to the state capitol, you don't need that. And I don't know of any other state department that requires that in Colorado or county. Um, and uh, the concern is why are why is this department collecting information? What are they doing with the information? Why do they need to hold on to it? So that's the end of my public comment for today. And I hope to see some of you next week um, or hear you on the phone during the state meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Welch. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hernandez, if you can just bear with me one quick second. Sorry. First of all, any questions for work? You alluded to the dates for stakeholder meetings, and I thought, as it happens, um, I was delighted to see these. Uh, they are set for 5.30 and 7.30 in each case on each of March 8th, March 13th, and again March 28th, all here. And there's call in and exactly consistent with what you just said, mm -hmm. um, sort of a WebEx or some sort of digital, yes, digital platform for participation. So I too would encourage board members as you're scheduling my right away. Listen in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Green, would you introduce yourself? I know who you are, but introduce <laughs> yourself for the record and let us know what you like to see. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Ron Fernandez, and um, thank you for allowing me. And uh, I, I can tell you that this 15 minutes of public comment really, I think, is probably helpful for the members and for allowing, allowing us to come in and be able to participate. To give you a, a, a unique perspective that maybe you might not ever want to hear outside of what is presented to you. So that's one of the reasons that we're here, is to try to give you different perspectives as you make decisions when it comes to rulemaking. Speaking of rulemaking, one of the questions that seems to come up that Marine and myself and as advocates in the community here time and time again, especially now as they struggle with this question of the Golden Dome, what this preponderance of evidence mean. They spent two and a half hours yesterday, all the legislators after they recessed when they room 271 and struggled with what does that mean? What does preponderance of evidence mean? They asked the particular person that was doing the investigation and said, well, and all this person said, well, it's preponderance of evidence. Well, the social legislator said, what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, and finally they came to the conclusion, well, it's just based on your judgment. That it's more likely than not that you've heard. What does that mean? More likely than not. And even one legislator said afterwards, what's a letter report? What does that mean? Based on what? Based on what facts? Based on, on, and the question that they had is that they were troubled that hearsay was allowed in the post investigation, especially in the court, the sixth, even sixth and hearsay was allowed to determine a preponderance of evidence. So most legislators that were attorneys and much brighter legal leaders than me um, talked to me afterwards, and I'm sure Maureen got some emails about this, that they are struggling with that question, that they would like to see a definition because they couldn't find one in the statute. So that is really troublesome to many people, especially when it comes to uh, investigations, especially HS investigations or child protective investigations. That, what does that standard mean? And they kind of walked away with thinking, well, it's based on judgment. Well, that means there's 100 different ideas of judgment across the street. And so, well, how do they collectively come up with what does preponderance of evidence mean? Did this solemnly really happen? Do you have hard evidence? Did this happen? And the way that the Senate dealt with this question is to say, all right, we're not going to just go along with, with uh, preponderance of evidence. We need hard evidence to determine what does that mean. And so they decided, to raise that bar to say hard evidence that there should probably be law enforcement involved and if they find something that's different. But I heard the discussion here to say, well, in child protective services, well, but if, if law enforcement determines that the individual is safe and walks away, 
but there's still an investigation that still proceeds along several different different algorithms. And so, uh, one of the things that is, is troublesome, I think, in the community is that the law enforcement says, your child is safe, the individual that we've discovered is safe. Three different law enforcement people knocked on the door said the individual is safe, but then you have APS, uh, and we have a case like this, April McDaniel, uh, just um, two months ago, that wasn't satisfactory to them. They made a phone call to the Division of Intellectual Developmental Disabilities, and they made a phone call to the Community Center for it, and said, hold the person. Even though the person said, I'm just, the law person said that they're safe in the home, they walked into the van with the back home, they were grocery shopping, the house was clean, but yet Adult Protective Services yanked the individual, placed them in a home, and even they said, no, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave. All based on before the investigation was completed. So that's troublesome. Um, because there wasn't anything there. So, so as we deal with what this preponderance of evidence means, it's like there's this rush to judgment ahead of time before an investigation gets there. And even when an investigation occurs and law enforcement says, gee, we don't see anything here. The individual is saying that. We have a special detective who, who focuses on these types of issues and determines the safety and health. And then the APS still goes down their path without, without cooperating with law enforcement. So that's sort of troublesome, all based on what this preponderance of evidence means. So as you consider rulemaking, consider using what does that standard of preponderance of evidence mean? So I, I, I will give you that, and I will thank you for the best meeting of the day, actually across the street, uh, under the Golden Dome, and with that we created a great night. So we just ask you to keep that in mind as you consider this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Questions from either of our guests? Sorry, I'm just watching. I won't. Chair, um, since I missed the last meeting, I'm really sick and I'm really sorry to have missed it. Um, um, it. I know that the minutes are coming out for the next meeting. They're done before the rest of the packet is done. Could they come out earlier than the rest of the package? <coughs> so I, I suspect I have a lot to do. My question is that the last name was five numbers long. I know. And I, 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 I totally understand why. Just know that I'd love to get it before the package. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you both for being here again and for your comments and questions. Ms. Welch, I'll go back and ask the question about our ID policy. Um, Mr. Hernandez, uh, I, we, I personally have heard these anecdotes of really bad situations, but I have yet to be told of a specific individual or family and a case that we could look into. And I'm not going to ask you to do that publicly, but I do want to mention that Ms. Rogers is here and uh, I would love it if we could touch base and find out who the situation was you were referring to so that we can, at a state level, look into it and understand what was done or not done in that situation. And Mr. Hernandez, I suspect I don't need to tell you this, but don't say anybody's, don't identify anybody now. <laughs> but I think Mr. Pika yeah. is inviting a, a, an offline yes. conversation. And, and if I could comment, the trouble with Mr. Pika is that these families are terrified and they live in fear that if they come forward and comment, you're going to go directly to that APS group in that particular county and say, what happened here? And then retaliation is going to be immediate. So if you can't see, well, you thought you were in trouble before, wait till Mr. Beach opens. And that's what they're fearful of. We'll make sure you never get to see your adult child again. We'll make, sure, we'll make things ten times worse, and we will we will put things into that registry that report that will keep barring you from ever being. So it's the fear that they live in, is that if they come forward to you, they're going to know that APS staff person in that county is going to know that they reported it. So how do you, so they want a safe place to come to it. I think I made that comment last time. Where is the safe place to come to it? Is that they don't feel safe about that great in this region. That's the problem. They would be willing to because there's several of them that want to, but they are terrified. You know, so, and we can talk about that uh, offline. Uh, we get ourselves in a catch-22, yes, right? Yes, There's yes. a situation, it's horrible, 
my job and my team's job is to look into it and fix it and, and change it if there are indeed systemic solutions. But then when then we can't find out the details because there's concern, which then potentially reinforces the situation. So um, I don't know. I hear that there could be perceived uh, retaliation. People can't generally be yanked out in adult protective services without some sort of court intervention and support. So we could uh, also, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying we're, we're sort of stuck, right? Because I can't fix or direct my team to fix something when we don't have any specifics. So I'm begging, please help me to uh, understand so that I can look into these cases and find out what's going on. Mr. 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 You know, there's probably one from that's going to come forward. Another one um, probably would would want to do that. I'll, I'll seek their their permission and their see what they want to do. But they, they're scared to death, to be honest with you. So they're afraid if they complain, it's going to make things worse. But I would tell them that you would offer publicly to make sure that that does not happen. That you will be fair-minded. That you will be objective in your assessment and check into this because I think you will find in most recent cases the most egregious one civil rights attorney looked at those <coughs> cases and said, Oh my God, this is lawless. I mean, and that was his description of, of what had happened. And especially after the agency that had the adult in, in their in their care determined that there there was nothing to be substantiated. But they just came along and said, No, we don't believe that uh, we're we're just going to yank but not further. It was a phone call. Phone call, and so there are lots of details. So how do we how do we fix that or pre prevent that from happening? And maybe it's one county or another. Maybe it's a couple counties. But I will tell you this: uh, we've heard from more than one guardianship attorney that uh, when it comes to being rational and reasonable, when it comes to these types of allegations of complaint, that Denver County seems to hold a very high standard. That's we heard we heard that from. We heard that from guardianship attorneys earlier this week that they're very sound when the investigations are involved, ATS, and they, they work collaboratively. So at least in Denver, we heard that, but we're not sure if that's the case in Denver. Thank you. Yes, Pat I'm sorry, Chad. So I think from listening to you for over the last few months, you guys have a tremendous responsibility of building the trust bridge. Yes. Because your transparency has been heard here and um, is offered, and I think you guys have a piece to play about building that trust. I don't know what it looks like, um, but just remember that as you continue your advocacy. Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. What I would like to do is get, get um, the entire team of that particular individual involved, because he does have an art that they can he she does have an art that So, and yet the art that is like, what just happened? So, um, so it's so I think probably I'll talk to the various team members in the agency that is serving them, and because uh, to give you a, a, an unredacted version of what had happened, and I think any reasonable person would look at this and go, "Oh my God, how could this have happened?" When nothing really is my fault. So I, I will I will take your offer back to that in that particular case, back to the team, and I think probably. Maybe, uh, or maybe at least boast so that you can get a good, strong feeling of what happened. And so, uh, to give you more details about what, what exactly happened. And, and I think it's important that you know that. And I hear you. Because if I was in your position, I'd say, well, oh, Mom, help me. I want to fix this. What do I do? And so we have to create some kind of, you're talking about a transparency bridge, but a safe bridge yep. for people. And which probably hasn't existed, but I think. Yeah, um, Maureen Welch, um, thank you so much for that comment. I do think that the uh, the last newsletter that I sent out, the newsletter we got it from, uh, really went a long way. The feedback I got from the community is that they were really feeling like this body and the APS state team is really trying to get information, and they are going to participate in that process. So I think that that action from the state and the APS side is really showing the community that you all want to hear. So I'm hoping that that also is movement toward that trust. So thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. And for the record, I'm not
I think I'm thinking you know, that small group I can commission. Gosh, no, we're just boring old board members. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you both very much indeed. And your hard work. Yes, they said Aren't you glad we're not on the legislature today? I said that a lot of time, actually. And there was a topic that you and I both did that. Thank you both very much.